Hi, my name is Emily Cartwright. I'm from Randolph, Massachusetts, and I'm a senior here at Holy Cross. I'm a biology major with a biochemistry concentration, and today I'm here with Dr. Fauci, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to interview him. What do you think the biggest contribution Holy Cross has made to your ultimate career has been? Well, I, I think uh, several things, but probably the most important was the broadness of the education I had here. I had an unusual um, um, curriculum uh, that today is probably not universally recognized even as a feasible curriculum, which was a fundamental majoring in classics and philosophy um, and having as much science as you actually needed to get into what your major was, which was pre-med. It was called AB Greek Pre-Med, which was very heavily steeped in the classics and philosophy. And it gave you a broad uh, humanities type of an education at the same time as you learned the science necessary to get into medical school. And that has really followed me throughout my career. Not that if you don't have that kind of education that you wouldn't be able to do the same thing, but it facilitated it for me to have a broad 40,000 foot look at my profession, the profession of medicine, which deals with scientific issues, but fundamentally deals with people in, 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 in issues related to everything from their physical health to their mental health to sociological and other aspects uh, of their existence. So being able to be educated at the uh, undergraduate level uh, in a broad scope of how the world works, how history has impacted on the kinds of things we'll do, I think for myself personally, put me in good stead for what I ultimately did, not only in medical school, but beyond medical school. Um, so I know you are a clinician and also a basic scientist. Um, when did you find that you uh, transitioned from clinician to also doing basic scientists? What was like the main driving force? Well, that? the main driving force was probably an accident, uh, and, and I'll explain what I mean. I went to medical school fundamentally wanting to be a practicing physician. That was uh, my burning passion and my burning desire. Uh, when I was getting ready to graduate medical school and do my internship and residency, it was during a historic period in our country when we were at war. It was the Vietnam War and all doctors were drafted. And we had the, uh, the opportunity to choose uh, in a priority way whether we would go into the public health service, which was a uniform service, the Navy, the Army, or the Air Force. And in my fourth year in medical school, I put as my first choice the public health service because I was interested in infectious diseases and the National Institutes of Health and the CDC were two components of the public health service were two possibilities and then after that I put Navy and Army and Air Force as a choice as it turns out I was accepted at the National Institutes of Health in the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases where I spent three years doing both basic and clinical research in the discipline of infectious diseases so it was my having to go for a three-year commitment as part of the draft that brought me to NIH that exposed me to the, to the beauty and the wonders of science and discovery at the National Institutes of Health. And it was because of that that I realized that that's what I like and that's what I want to be an important part of my professional life. So that's why I balance now my clinical activities with my fundamental basic research activities as well as the administrative activities that I do. That's my next question is, what is the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and what do you specifically do there? The National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases is the second largest of a group of 27 institutes that fall under the umbrella of the National Institutes of Health, which is located in Bethesda, Maryland, about five miles north of the Washington, D.C. metropolitan uh, uh, core of the city. It just takes a few minutes to to you know, 15 minutes maybe to drive from downtown Washington to where the, uh, the NIH is. It's a part of the federal government, the executive branch of the federal government. It's part of the Department of Health and Human Services, and it is the largest funder of biomedical research in the world. Uh, it's a $31 billion budget for the whole NIH. My institute, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases that I direct is responsible 
for research on all infectious diseases. And by research, we mean understanding the pathogenesis, treatment, diagnosis, prevention with vaccines, and treatment with drugs of everything from HIV AIDS through malaria, tuberculosis, neglected tropical diseases, childhood vaccinations. And in addition, we're fundamentally responsible for research on the immune system and aberrancies of the immune system, like asthma, allergies, hypersensitivity diseases, and transplantation. So we have a broad portfolio of about $5 billion as part of the broader National Institutes of Health. Um, also, what do you think the biggest public health concern is facing Americans today? Well, there are more than one. I don't think you can say this is the most important one. There are several. I mean, clearly, uh, when you look at um, public health, it's the uh, access, equal access, as it were, to health care. Of course, we still have considerable numbers of people in this country who don't have good access to health care, and that's what the whole issue of health care reform is all about, to try to do that in a successful way. That's been very problematic with people having differences of opinion about that, but just health care in general is important. When you talk about specific issues, uh, it really depends on the segments of the population. HIV AIDS is still a very important problem, particularly in the African American population in the United States. 12% of the United States population is African American, yet 50% of the new cases of HIV AIDS in this country are among African Americans. So there's a great disparity, health disparity, with regard to HIV, and we need to do a better job at that. The other one is something that it really is almost diffusely spread throughout society, but also even much more in economically deprived people is the whole issue of obesity and diabetes. Uh, I mean, obviously cardiovascular disease and cancer are very important, but the things that are getting a bit out of control now is that there's a much, much greater problem with obesity in this country, not to mention the possibility of emerging infectious diseases. We were fortunate that we did have a pandemic last year, the H1N1 so-called swine flu, but it turned out to be relatively mild. There's always the danger of emerging infectious diseases, particularly devastating diseases that come along very rarely, but when they do, they can have a great public health impact. So there's a combination of things that are established diseases that are there that you can deal with, and then there's the unknown and the uncertainty of the emergence of a disease that you've never heard of before. That happened with HIV in 1981 when many people thought it was going to turn out to be something trivial that would go away, and now it's one of the most important infectious diseases in the history of our civilization. So we always have to be on guard for those emerging diseases. Are there any emerging or re-emerging infectious diseases that you are particularly worried about coming, becoming a new pandemic? Well, we're always concerned about the possibility of a new pandemic of influenza, and we always have to keep our guard up about that. Uh, I wouldn't say I worry about that. I'm alert to it, and other public health officials are too. So that's one of the things that we really need to be concerned about. Another thing is something that is becoming a progressively uh, important problem is the reemergence of antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria, such as methicillin resistant Staph aureus and uh, in drug resistant tuberculosis in the developing world, um, drug resistant malaria, uh, certain what we call gram negative bacteria like Klebsiella are emerging in a resistant way. So that's something we have to be concerned about. The things that are going on today, uh, for example, is the reemergence of cholera in Haiti. Because cholera is in Haiti, there's always the danger that it'll spread throughout the region, such as in the Caribbean. And if it gets to the Caribbean because of the link of the Caribbean to the United States, there's always that possibility you'll have emergence. I think the sanitary conditions in the United States are such that would preclude our having a really bad cholera epidemic. But cholera is not just a thing of the history nor a thing of Asia and Africa. It's seen right here in our own hemisphere. So there are many diseases that can emerge and reemerge. And one of the dilemmas about emerging diseases and reemerging diseases is that you just can't predict. There was no way we would have predicted that we would have had cholera in, um, in uh, Haiti. And we were talking about dengue, which is a mosquito-borne serious disease, potentially serious disease that was always around in Brazil and the Caribbean. And now just last year, we had cases in Florida, in the Keys and in Dade County. So emerging and re-emerging infections are a constant threat. 